Anti Muslim bigotry is real. And I am a member of a Muslim family, and I am a member of the Muslim community. Uh, I always have been for, for, for my whole life. So I've been on the receiving end of anti Muslim bigotry. So I, I know it's real. But I also know that Islamic oppression is real as well. As an atheist, I've received death threats from Muslims, many of whom are correctly quoting the Quran. Like they've sent me verses in the Quran talking about why it's justified for them scripturally to do what they want to do to me because of the things that I say are right. And it really, it doesn't have to be one or the other. I mean, both of these things are real. It's not like, is this real? Is that real? Both of these things exist. So one of the common rebuttals to this when I bring it up is, uh, you know, what about Christianity and all of the horrors that it, inf it inflicted upon Europe in the Dark Ages? And my answer to that is, I agree. Uh, someone wrote to me, I recently did a, uh, there was a, a feature in uh, a magazine, a literary magazine out of, um, I think, uh, North Carolina called The Sun. Not, not The Sun that we have here, but this is a, this is a different magazine. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the people, the commenters who, who read it, he wrote, and uh, he said, he brought up this exact point, what about Christianity? And he said that, quote, Christianity was the driving force behind the annihilation of Native Americans, behind slavery, Jim Crow, and the KKK. So I wrote back, they asked me for comment, and I wrote back and I said, well, why is it not okay to say the same thing about Islam? I agree with you that Christianity did all those things, but in many parts of the world, Islam, the Islamic doctrine, the ideology, has been the driving force behind slavery, behind um, the slaughter of minority religions and sects uh, and, the, and the execution of apostates and homosexuals, all at a scale rivaling that of Christianity and moreover, unlike Christianity, continuing to a significant extent today. You know, not, not to say that there aren't problems with Christianity today, but to a large extent, most of the developed world, unlike a few hundred years ago, has been secularized. So then there was a rebuttal that it's because of our Western imperialism and colonization and, and bombing of Muslim majority countries that they're, and, and, and these people are just reacting to that. To that again, I say, yes, I grew up in these countries. So I was born in Pakistan when I was just a few months old. We moved to Libya, lived in Tripoli for several years. Then I was in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, lived there for about 12 years. Um, went back to Pakistan for university. I didn't come to North America until I was 24. The first time I came here, I was 24. And I spent uh, most of my life, the first 24 years of my life, in um, three different Muslim-majority countries, one in North Africa, one that was actually the heart and the birthplace of Islam in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, and then one that was colonized historically uh, by both uh, Arabs, and you know, which brought about Islam, and also uh, by the British. So it's subject to both. Um, so I, I tell them, yes, I, I do agree that, you know, I agree that the horrors, uh, about the horrors that U.S. foreign policy has brought upon a whole number of Muslim-majority countries. But what does U.S. foreign policy have to do with subjugating women, taking Yazidi girls as young as nine years old as sex slaves, as ISIS does, uh, it's, uh, you know, blasphemy laws, jailing and killing people for blasphemy and apostasy, imprisoning and executing bloggers like my friend Raif Badawi, who's in, who's in jail in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, um, simply for doing exactly what I do here, write and blog about secularism, um, or publicly hanging homosexuals or, you know, uh, in more extreme cases, throwing them off buildings. So... Whenever there's a school shooting, we talk about guns, mental health legislation, the Second Amendment, um, even the violent music or video games that the shooters may have been playing. We look at every aspect of what went into these events. But when there is an Islamic terrorist act, you know, first of all, we don't want to call it an Islamic terrorist act, um, even though the terrorists are telling us why they're doing what they're doing. They're quoting verses from the Quran, like, like this. So this is, you know, Quran, Surah 8, verse 12. Uh, your Lord inspired to the angels, I am with you, so strengthen those who have believed. I will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieved. 
to strike them upon the necks and strike from them every fingertip. And this was actually historically revealed during the Battle of Badr, which is a, a war that Muhammad fought with you know, people of Mecca. Uh, he was very outnumbered, so everybody says it's in that context. But the next verse makes it clear that that's just an example. But whoever opposes Allah and his messenger, indeed Allah is severe in penalty. Or you look at uh, 29 and 30, you know. In the fight, those who do not believe in Allah the last say, this is about uh, the Christians and Jews and who do not adopt the religion of truth from those who are given the scripture, fight until they give the jizya tax, a heavy tax for non-Muslims, willingly, while they're humbled. Um, so, you know, basically fight them or get them to convert or get them to pay a tax. And uh, this is something that ISIS has been following. ISIS, who is, people say, has nothing to do with Islam, is actually completely correlated to this verse. So... You know, whenever we're faced with things like this, we say, well, you know, it's economics, it's politics, it's it's our foreign policy. Maybe it's about poverty, maybe it's about disenfranchisement. And sure, it could be all of these things. All of these things have a part to play. I'm not denying that. But they say that it's nothing to do with Islam. The one thing, we're hesitant to call out religion itself as a key cause of religious atrocities. So, again... I'm not denying those other factors aren't real, but I'm talking about not denying that the religion itself is a key driver. So, you know, wh one more example of how obscurantist the discourse currently is on, on Islamic ideology, and I'll just, uh, we'll take a little, uh, just a little bit about, a little history lesson here. So, I'll just have you read this quote, I'll read it out loud for you. Uh, the, the one in the red box. The ambassador answered us that it was founded upon the laws of the Prophet that was written in their Quran that all nations who should not have acknowledged their authority were sinners, that it was their right and duty to make war upon them wherever they could be found and to make slaves of all they could take. Oh, I, I forgot this is right here too. As uh, prisoners and that every Muslim, which is every Muslim, who, is who was slain in battle was sure to go to paradise. Oh, the ideology sounds familiar, but when is this from? Anybody want to take a guess? Yes. yes. So this is from 1786. This is uh, for the diplomatic correspondence, as you see. I thought that was a clue. Um, this is Thomas Jefferson when he went to Tripoli in 1786 to negotiate uh, with the, with the, um, uh, the uh the, the authorities in Tripoli, that at that point, what was, it's a long story, but a lot of Western ships were coming in to trade into the Mediterranean Sea, and uh, the Barbary states, which was the North African states at the time, were, were going out and pirating them, and essentially uh, taking uh, these, uh, the, the people on the ships and making them prisoners and enslaving them. And this is a justification that they gave to it, to, to Thomas Jefferson. So this is him reporting back uh, what uh, the, the envoy to Tripoli told him, uh, reporting it back to the Secretary of State, John Jay, in 1786. Now, this was two and a quarter centuries ago. So before ISIS, before Al-Qaeda, it was before the creation of Israel or the Arab-Israeli conflict. It's before Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran and the Iranian Revolution. It's before Saudi Arabia. It's before the Taliban, before drone strikes, before the Cold War, before any of the world wars, before Herzl founded the Zionist movement, before Americans knew what jihad was or even what Islam was, it was before the United States had engaged in any military operation overseas, and it was before the existence of any U.S. foreign policy, because there functionally wasn't really an established United States at the time. But these words about the laws of the Quran, about taking slaves, waging holy war, martyrdom, read as if they could just have been, or they could, you could find them in a newspaper pretty much any week today. And it's attributed to, like, well, you know, this is about U.S. foreign policy. Uh, but this passage is over 200 years old, and it still rings with relevance today. So, yes, the discourse around this is obscurantist, and, and it is very confused. But here's the tough thing. This is a profile that was done on, on, on my book and we, in, 
in the Atlantic. It was called The Dilemma Facing Ex-Muslims in Trump's America. So right now we're in a tough spot. So on the one hand, as liberals, and I'm speaking for myself as a liberal, we want to challenge illiberal ideas as they exist in all religions, you know, in Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism. But on the other hand, our liberal conscience, conscience wants us to, as, as it should have us, protect the rights of minority groups like Muslims who actually are targets of prejudice in modern times with Trump calling for bans and um, you know, and Muslims entering the country and all of this other stuff. And, and what we want to do is we want to defend their right to believe what they want to believe. So remember, when we talk about secularism, secularism isn't the opposite of religious freedom. The opposite of religious freedom is anti-religious bigotry. Secularism is just a separation of religion and state, which allows both the freedom to believe as one wishes and also the freedom to challenge those beliefs and those ideas. Secularism is about freedom of religion and freedom from religion. And the way that I propose we resolve this dilemma, <coughs> excuse me, is something that I wish was much more obvious because I think it's common sense and it's true. And it's also one of the driving theses of my book. There is a big difference between challenging Islamic doctrine and demonizing Muslim people. Human beings have rights and are entitled to respect. Ideas, books, and beliefs don't and aren't. The right to believe what one wants is sacred. The beliefs themselves aren't. Challenging ideas move societies forward. Demonizing people rips societies apart. So the question here is there's a confusion about the definition of a religion. How do you define a religion? Religion is, um, let's take it this way. A lot of my Jewish friends, most of my, Dana and I were talking about this earlier, is that most Jewish people that we know are non-religious. Uh, a, lot, a lot of Jewish friends that I have I really, really love bacon. Now, does that mean, you know, I have lots of Jewish friends that eat bacon. That means Judaism is okay with bacon. Does that make sense? No. But we do hear a lot that we hear that a lot about Muslims. Like I have a lot of I have a Muslim friend and you know he's very peaceful, he's got a girlfriend, you know, he drinks alcohol once in a while. That doesn't mean that Islam is okay with all of those things. None of these none of these religions are. That applies to the Bible and the Quran and, and everything else. So Islam is an ideology that's defined by the contents of its canonical texts. And Muslims are human beings who are often Muslim only as an accident of birth, just happen to be born in a Muslim family. Any of you who's born in a Muslim family would most likely be Muslim or identify as Muslim. Many of them barely know anything about the religion. Okay, there you go. So, and uh, this is something I talk about in the book. There, in countries where Muslims are a minority, like here, Islam is an identity. In countries where Muslims are a majority, Islam is a religion. So this is a dichotomy. This has consequences for a, a liberal leaning people on, on either side, liberals here and liberals over there. So for the liberal in North America, Islam is a faith of a very small minority of Muslims who are often discriminated against and whose rights must be protected as with any other minority group. But for the liberal in a Muslim majority country, Islam is a tool that the government, the Islamic government, uses to justify censorship, oppression, other illiberal views like forcing women to wear the hijab, right, or persecuting homosexuals, or publicly lashing bloggers. The same holy book that Muslims in the United States and Canada revere as divine and peaceful is used by the governments of Muslim majority countries to, to endorse everything from domestic violence uh, to the execution of apostates. The hijab, which is the headscarf, it's worn proudly by Muslim American women or Muslim Canadian women who choose it as a symbol of their identity, is forced on, on many women in many Muslim majority countries by the governments, as in Saudi Arabia and Iran, or by imams or by their husbands. 
And many criticisms of Islamic doctrine that are made by liberal reformers and dissidents in Muslim majority countries are labeled Islamophobic when they're voiced here. So this can get really confusing really fast because in their well-intentioned effort to protect what they see as a targeted minority, which is Muslims, many Western liberals unintentionally find themselves fighting to guard and protect the same backward values that their counterparts, their liberal counterparts in Muslim majority countries are fighting against. So the consequences of this conflict between ideology and identity, Islam the ideology, Muslim the identity, can manifest itself in all kinds of complex ways. So uh, let's get back to the hijab issue specifically to illustrate how. So we know about the story, right? I think everybody's heard about it. Uh, this was in uh, right here in, in, in Canada. Uh, there was a, an 11 year old girl who came home one day and she told her parents that a stranger had cut up her hijab with scissors in an apparent hate crime against Muslims. She's just 11. The story exploded, for lack of a better term, and everyone was outraged, as they should have been, uh, because if, if the story was true, this is a, this is a horrific thing for, for a little girl to go through. But as it turns out, the story wasn't true. The girl had made it all up. Now, they had a whole bunch of narratives popping up, you know, usually on different sides of the political uh, aisle. Um, you know, some people were saying that, you know, well, the Muslims are obsessed with victimhood and, you know, exaggerating anti, they're exaggerating anti-Muslim hate crimes and so on. So this was a case that she just made it up and her parents probably coached her. And then others said, well, you know, it's a kid, you know, kids lie all the time and we shouldn't be holding the parents responsible for this and all these other narratives. But the one analysis that, that really caught my attention, I was looking through all these like newspapers and stuff. And then I had a conversation with my own mother. My mother is an educational psychologist. She's a guidance counselor who's worked uh, with Islamic faith schools in, in Toronto, like, like ISNA, the ISNA school, and Al Sadiq, which is a more Shia school. And uh, this is what she said about it. This is what she wrote. The incident could have been the creation of this little girl's mind, but why did she make it up? Because she didn't want to be isolated. She wanted to be like other girls. She wanted to make friends. She didn't want to be ridiculed. In short, she didn't want to be different. She didn't want the scarf. She probably thought that by seeing the hij her hijab as a security risk, her parents wouldn't force her to wear it. And this is a narrative that I didn't hear. And this is one that she said was very familiar to her because in, in a lot of these faith schools, all the little girls are required to wear hijab. So this is a situation that she saw commonly where you know these little girls are looking for any way to convince their parents or the school to not have them wear it because they just want to be normal. So you know, keep in mind that this is not an isolated incident. There have been several cases in the US as well of young women, usually aged 18 or 19, faking stories about being harassed for wearing hijab, especially since Trump came into power. And one of them, it later turned out, was, was lied about it to her parents because she was out with friends and she was hanging out with them, which she wasn't allowed to do. And she made up the hijab attack as an excuse to her parents for being late. And you know, the, uh, this is a common. We had in Mississauga, you know, my, where I'm from, there was a, uh, there was a case of uh, Aksa Pervez, who was, who was a, a girl who was a victim of an honor killing. Her father and brother murdered her because uh, they followed her to school. And they found out when she got to school, she would take off her hijab. She was coming back home, she'd put it back on. So this is something that's happening here. It's a, it's a, it's a cultural conflict. And it's, a, it's, a, it's one of those places where the ideology aspect and the identity aspect uh, clash. And let me explain that a little bit. As someone who corresponds with young Muslims, usually questioning Muslims and former believing Muslims, formerly, ex-Muslims all the time, I often come across insights that the mainstream media discourse is completely clueless about. So say there is a young girl raised in Toronto or Chicago or Los Angeles, any of these uh, Western cities, and she's made to wear hijab from a young age. She grows older, she wants to be part of the community she's in. She wants to be like her friends. 
right? She wants to be, uh, she's exposed to ideas of women's rights and feminism. She's learning about critical thinking and the scientific method and, and comparative religion in school, knowing that all these religions kind of sound alike. And all of this is kind of coming together for her, and it's making her question this piece of cloth on her head, which was historically, historically where it came from, it was meant to guard her attractiveness from the eyes of lustful men. So it's an ancient symbol of patriarchal oppression and misogyny. And indeed, it's, it's one that men force women to wear by law in places like Iran and Saudi Arabia. So she's rebelling against it from within, rebelling within her, fa her family, against her family. She's rebelling against her Muslim community. She's questioning it. And she's struggling with the ideology behind the hijab. Then along comes Donald Trump saying all Muslims should be banned from the U.S. And all these other comments reflecting unprecedented anti-Muslim sentiment for any uh, U.S. president ever. Now this becomes an identity issue. Now the hijab itself becomes a symbol of rebellion against this other kind of fascism. One that may feel even more disappointing to her because she was so close, she was almost there. She was aligning with her values as, as, a, as a Western woman in a, in a country that was adopted by her parents. She was getting there, but now, screw that. You think, you know, she's saying, she's like, you know, you think people like me and my family who are just as American as anyone else should be considered lesser because we happen to be born in different circumstances? Well, no, I'm gonna keep this thing on. I hate what it stands for, I have problems with it, but I also hate what you stand for. So this is, when you see women who wear the hijab today in our cities and our neighborhoods, you should always keep that in mind. This is a conflict between ideology and identity. This is a struggle that's happening within them as much as it's happening outside in the interaction between them and everybody else. It's not easy for them. And we should recognize that and be sensitive to it uh, whenever we engage in this kind of dialogue. So, Yes, Islam is not the same thing as Muslims. And criticizing Islam is not the same thing as demonizing Muslims. So when we speak critically about Islam, it's not about the majority of peaceful believers. Of course it's not. You know, I'm from a family. My entire family is, is, is Muslim. But it's about specific doctrines that are illiberal, that are often violent, that are often misogynistic. If a small room in your house is on fire, you wouldn't dismiss it because, well, you know, the rest of the house is fine, so just ignore the small room. And that's not how we go about things. So criticizing Islam, as we criticize Christianity, as we do Mormonism, as Scientology, that isn't bigotry. But singling it out for protection is bigotry. So I'm going to start with, uh, talk a little bit about how my own thing started, and my own life started actually, not just my journey. Um, started with these words, started with the words Allahu Akbar. I was born in Lahore in a hospital called Lady Willington Hospital. The first words that were whispered into my ear as soon as I was born were Allahu Akbar. It was a part of the prayer call, um, the Adhan, which uh, they do in a lot, a lot of Muslim uh, cultures around the world. That's what they do as soon as a baby's born. They they, they, they sort of recite the adhan into the prayer call, into the ears of the babies. So that's how it started. And you know, when I grew up, it was a wonderful phrase. We used to hear Allahu Akbar means God is great. You know, we used to say it at birthdays. We used to say it when, you know, in times of blessing and, uh, you know, when someone uh, did really well on an exam, it was congratulatory at weddings everywhere. So, you know, people used to say it for strength uh, and it had very positive associations. But now it's really scary. You know, if you're in a, even in Muslim majority countries, there's videos in Syria of some guy who says Allahu Akbar and everybody starts running. The moment you hear these words, you know, it's, it's this sign that something really bad is about to happen. Um, and that association is, uh, you know, it's, it's I, in, in my book I get into, I won't go into now. Uh, I kind of go into what happened in the 1970s, you know, whether it's the, 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 um, the rising of Saudi Arabia as, a, as an economic power, the war in Afghanistan against the Soviets, where the U.S. supported the Mujahideen or the Iranian Revolution. There, there are a lot of things that brought back. There's a resurgence of Islamic fundamentalism that came back that uh, made this, you know, the, this phrase really, really dangerous. 
And uh, actually, it's not just this phrase. I mean, I could uh, I could go to a, a restaurant, and if I want to be get to the front of line, I'd have to shout anything in Arabic. I could just go, you know, Ana Hebbal Moz. Someone knows what that means. What does that mean? Do you guys know? Any Arabic okay, speakers? I mean, uh, is it specifically in a banana split? Or? There you go. So Ana Hebbal Moz means I love bananas. And I could say that really loud, but if it's in Arabic, it'll just scare the crap out of people. You know, and so I have this. Uh, I'll show you this. This is kind of fun too. And so, you know. <laughs> I know. So, it's, so this is, you know, that's the thing about this phrase. God, and and so I have that history with it. And I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, how I grew up. So, especially in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia, my family is a, you know, is a Shia Muslim family. Uh, but they're relatively moderate. They're sort of like moderate liberal, uh, not super fundamentalists. And, uh, you know, in our house, the Quran was at the highest point in the house. It was on top of a small, uh, uh, sorry, not a small, a tall bookshelf. It was the highest level in the house. And it was wrapped up in a scented cloth. It was all in Arabic. You know, this is in the 80s, so remember there was no internet at the time. And uh, like the vast majority of Muslims in the world, you know, we didn't speak Arabic. None of my family did. The largest Muslim populations in the world are in Indonesia, non-Arabic speaking. India, same thing. Uh, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Iran, Turkey. Now, then when you get to Egypt, Egypt is the largest Arabic, Arab speaking, uh, Arabic speaking uh, Muslim majority country. Uh, but most Muslims in the world don't speak Arabic. So the Quran would be up there. You had to do a special ablution and washing ritual before you could touch it. If you were a woman, you were menstruating, you couldn't touch it or recite it. Um, I, we could barely even reach it, it was so high up. And, uh, you know, if we read it, we read it without translation, we just recited it. It was considered a, a good thing, and we recited it in Arabic, didn't know what it meant. Um, so, meanwhile, I was also surrounded in Riyadh, and we were surrounded by Saudi laws, subjugation of women beheadings for everything from, you know, they had public beheadings, they still do, in a central square in Riyadh that uh, we'd been to a lot. It was in the middle of a market. It's affectionately called Chop Chop Square. Really, that's not a joke. You can Wikipedia it. Um, uh, fighting infidels, all this stuff just on TV about fighting infidels, fighting Jews all the time. Amputation of hands for theft. Shoplift a CD, get your hand cut off. Uh, my parents said that this wasn't real Islam. They're like, oh, these guys are crazy. I'm like, but wasn't, you know, didn't, isn't this a, the birthplace of Islam? Isn't this where it all happened? They're like, yeah, but they've corrupted it. They've, you know, completely changed it. And most of my friends took them at their word. They're like, okay, you know, this isn't real Islam. You hear that all the time. It's like, no, those Saudis aren't real Islam. What I did was I started reading the Quran. Now, this is at a time when you didn't have the internet, and I had to go out and buy a paperback. Uh, no matter what translation I bought, if somebody told me it was the wrong translation, it was just impossible. And so I got a couple of them, and I read it. And I wanted to find out about these things. I was like, you know, sex slavery, really? Is that in the Quran? Those paperbacks, you couldn't, the index, there was no entry for sex slavery. So I had to actually go through every page. I had to read the book from cover to cover. I underlined, I folded pages, and I was like 12 years old. And... That's when I became an atheist. I, I don't know if it was Isaac Asimov or who, who said that the Bible, reading the Bible is the surefire way of becoming an atheist. I, I can't remember the exact person who said it, but that applies to the Quran as well. And the problem is when I started reading it, I was looking at all these Saudi laws that my parents had told me weren't real Islam. And here it is. This is, uh, again, I, I put this up before, 929, 930, fighting the infidels, making them pay the tax or making them convert. Here's the uh, the 434, the famous verse that says you can, uh, you know, if your wives from whom you fear arrogance or disobedience, and not even if they're arrogant, but if you just fear it, you know, you can forsake them in bed, you can admonish them, and then finally you can strike them, you can hit them, idrubuhunna, which is just incontrovertible translation in, in Arabic. Anybody who speaks Arabic knows what it means. Another one, amputation of hands. Surah 5, verse 38, as for the thief, the male and the female, amputate their hands in recompense for what they committed as a deterrent punishment from Allah. 
all of this stuff was in there. And this was depressing. So uh, this, again, was before the internet. But today, everything is very different. At that time, I was the only one who was seeing this. I had to take these books and I had to open it up to the right pages and show it to people. And then, you know, they'd be like, well, and I was doing this in Saudi Arabia, which is very dangerous. Eventually, my parents told me to stop. Uh, but, um, you know, they'd anytime I'd show them something, they're like, you know, that's translated wrong. This is wrong. Or this is interpreted wrong. This guy who translated it used to be a Jew and he converted to Islam. So this is a Jewish conspiracy. There are all kinds of excuses. You just never got around. But today... Any 12-year-old kid can go online, they can find these verses by keyword search. They can find literal translations just by hovering over a word. There it is, وَتْرُبُهُنَّ And finally strike them. I mean, this is, you hover over the word, you get the literal translation of what it means. You can go to this thing called the Corpus Quran, and it has translations in multiple languages, and at every word, every verse. You want to delve into the, the, the um, sorry, the, uh oh, one second. Yeah, you want to get into the, the grammar or the syntax. You can do that for every single word. It's all right there. You don't have to be, you can just do this in seconds with a search. The process is not as arduous as it was, it was when I was young. So the consequences of this have been really interesting. Right? And it's become harder for, I guess, New Age moderates like Reza Aslan, for instance, to whitewash uh, Islam. And sadly, you know, many who were raised to think that this is the infallible word of God, and uh, they were often from mildly religious back parents. And I, I've known a lot of people like this recently. Um, parents weren't that religious, but they're like, you know, this is the infallible word of God. This is the Quran. This is our religion. This is our heritage. You got to follow it. You can't question it. And you grow up and then they finally read it. And their parents never read it. Their parents are actually decent, normal, okay, well acclimated, well integrated people. They just said what their parents had said. And they tell their kids this. The kids go on the internet. They find all this stuff that their parents didn't even know about. And they're like, okay, that's it. I'm joining ISIS. And they go and they, they go to Syria. That happens, but fortunately, it's in a minority of cases. More than that, there has been an explosion, again, for lack of a better term, of atheism in the Muslim world, of, of people leaving Islam, especially among the youth. So in, in America alone, I mean, I mean there, was, there was a poll that just came out a couple of days ago uh, from Pew Research that showed that in, in the United States, uh, people who were born into Christian families, 22% of them now don't associate with Christianity. People born into Muslim families in the United States, now 23% of them have stopped believing in the religion. That's almost a quarter of them. Of course, the report also states that there are many converts into Islam, so that kind of balances it out. But uh, that, that's just something that I, I don't think was happening that much before. Um, when, I, I, sorry, Gallup had a poll about, I think in 2012 or 2013, <coughs> that showed that in Saudi Arabia, the number of people who identify as non-religious in Saudi Arabia is 19%. And the number of people, the percentage of people that identify as confirmed atheists, or convinced atheists, I think was the term they use, is 5%. Same as in the United States. In Saudi Arabia, which is a country of about 20 million, <coughs> now that's a conservative estimate. That's 1 million atheists in Saudi Arabia. When Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, was translated into Arabic. It was downloaded 10 million times. In Muslim majority countries, three million of those were in Saudi Arabia. And of all the correspondence that I get, most of it is from Saudi Arabia. So it's actually, it's really interesting how this stuff is happening. Excuse me, I'm just going to get some water and pull a Marco Rubio. Um, <clears throat> and Mariam Namazi has said this, and Mariam Namazi is the founder of the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. And she said the internet is doing to Islam today what the printing press did in the past to Christianity and paved the way for the enlightenment and, and all the freedoms and the liberties and the, and the, that we enjoy today. So I, I also want to point out that it was just less than 30 years ago that Salman Rushdie wrote a book called The Satanic Verses. And that book, because of that, 
there was a there was a um, a bounty placed on his head by the, uh, the supreme leader of Iran at the time, Ayatollah Khomeini. He was forced into hiding, went into hiding for 10 years, couldn't surface, had to live away from his family, had to move from place to place. Uh, at one point, even tried to say that he accepted Islam in, in an effort to get the fatwa reversed. Didn't happen. And he struggled with it for long. It was less than 30 years ago. Um, 12 years ago, you had the Danish cartoons, and you know Muslims all over the world rioted because of cartoons of the Prophet. Three years ago, you had Charlie Hebdo. You know, same thing. Cartoon, lots of cartoon controversies. And now, in just the last year, uh, Mariam Namazi organized the largest ex-Muslim conference ever in history in London, uh, with uh, a lot of people, a lot of scientists and philosophers, everybody attended there, uh, a lot of rationalists. We had to, there's a group called Muslimish that brings together former Muslims and questioning Muslims. Uh, they had two conferences last year, one in New York where I spoke. Uh, I, sp I spoke at both of them, and then Sarah Hader and some of these other uh, sort of prominent ex-Muslims also spoke there. And in December, they had one in Detroit. Um, you had, you know, my book came out. And then we had, there, there's so many different things uh, that have happened. XMNA, Sarah's organization, um, the ex-Muslims of North America is currently, they've organized a college campus tour uh, called Normalizing Dissent that's going around different colleges and they're, they're talking about this issue. Um, and uh, we also have started a podcast, me, and it's called, let's put it here. Hold on. Yeah, Secular Jihadists for Muslim Enlightenment. So we've started this, uh, we've had uh, all kinds of really interesting guests on from Majid Nawaz to uh, Ron Miscavige, who's the father of David Miscavige, the founder or, or the, the current head of the Church of Scientology, to uh, just all kinds of interesting things where we're having this dialogue. A lot of the ideas I'm talking about here that we discuss in detail uh, with many prominent um, I guess, atheists around the world in Muslim majority countries, like from Jordan, from Egypt, a girl who escaped uh, Saudi Arabia now lives in Germany. Um, and so we've had a lot of interesting episodes, and we're kind of bringing these voices out uh, to a Western audience that may not be familiar with this narrative. Uh, so do check it out if you get the chance. Um, uh, moving on, yeah, and I, I, so this is the Muslim Enlightenment, and I, I'd be happy if you could all uh, support it and get behind it. So I want to kind of end with a quick note on what I call Islamophobia phobia. All right, so let's explain this. So I was actually here in Ottawa. Uh, November 6th, I was testifying in front of the Standing Committee on Canadian Heritage on the recent motion, M103. So M103, uh, as uh, many of you know, is a motion uh, that was presented to Parliament. It's now been passed. It's not a law. It's not a bill. Uh, that um, basically has, says that uh, you know we shouldn't engage in Islamophobia. And, and, and it has gotten a lot of criticism from the opposition, uh, including both the Conservative Party and some people in the NDP, um, who say it's a liberal proposal, who say that it impinges on, on freedom of speech and on people criticizing Islam, as in I myself right now doing this talk would be in violation of this if this was a law. Uh, and I want to sort of talk about what I said there. Now, I was... I am from the riding that elected Ikra Khalid, who was who was the MP who uh, who proposed Motion 103 to the Parliament and drafted it. And uh, while I told them, I said, you know, while I'm still aligned with the Liberal Party on most issues, um, I do want to point out some areas of disagreement. And I drove home the same point. So I'll read from it. We're almost done, I think, with the time here. So I'll just read a little bit of my statement. Um, and then, and then we'll close from here and we'll go to Q&A. So I wrote, on the evening of January 29th, 2017, oh, it's been a year now, we were shocked by the news of a horrific terrorist attack at the Islamic Cultural Center of Quebec City. Six Muslim worshippers were murdered in cold blood and 19 others injured. The suspect is a young student now known to have had anti-Muslim views who claimed to have been inspired by far-right nationalism and leaders like Marine Le Pen. This terrorist attack as of today has a higher death count than any of the Islamic terrorist attacks that have ever taken place in Canada. 
So for Motion 103 to have been passed in the aftermath of the Quebec City attack is understandable well, with well-placed intentions. It was drafted before, but it was passed after. I am part of a Muslim family. I grew up in several Muslim-majority countries, so I told them my history. Um, even though I'm, I am an atheist, I still get called jihadist and dirty Muslim online, and I'm frequently told, back, told to go back to my country. In the past few years, anti-Muslim sentiment has risen dramatically. Why? Well, first, people around the world following current events have seen on their TV screens numerous attacks in Paris, Brussels, Nice, Orlando, London, New York, San Bernardino, Ottawa, Edmonton, and more, perpetrated by men yelling Allahu Akbar, and in most cases, pledging allegiance to the Islamic State, which uses a particularly literal and severe interpretation of Islamic scripture to justify its actions. And second, many far-right and sadly even mainstream right <coughs> politicians have exploited the resulting concerns and fears that many Westerners have to drum up anti-Muslim sentiment even further. This has manifested itself in, in many ways, and this includes everything from the attacks on uh, the harassment of Muslims to you know, the targeting of Sikhs, just because a lot of people don't know that they're not, not everybody who wears a turban has a beard is, is a Muslim. Um, so in light of all this, having a motion like M103 makes sense, but then why is it so controversial? Why doesn't it have more support from the opposition? And this is what I want to talk to you about today. So I went on and I talked to you about, I talked to them about many of the things I said today, about the difference between Islam and Muslims, how criticizing Islam and uh, demonizing Muslims are two completely different things. And I told them this is the no man's land that I find myself in. There's Islamic fundamentalism on one hand, there's anti-Muslim bigotry on the other, and I've gotten it from both sides. So. Here is the problem with the word Islamophobia. The word Islamophobia is an umbrella term that conflates legitimate criticism of Islam, as is being done by many of my fellow liberals and secular activists who are trying to change our societies in the Muslim world, with the demonization of Muslims, which is obviously wrong. And this is, you know, the point that I can't drive home enough. Now. When we say anti-Semitism, we say anti-Semitism. Do we say Judaismophobia? No, it's a strange term. It's not something that has caught on because I don't think anybody really proposed it. And the reason we don't is because this is a term, anti-Semitism is a term that's oriented around prejudice against people, not ideas, right? So demonizing people right, goes against our liberal values and, and we shouldn't do it. But Criticizing dogmatic ideas and beliefs is at the very heart of free speech. And it's also one of our fundamentalist, uh, fundamental fundamentalist values. All right, so again, criticizing Islam isn't bigotry. It's singling it out for protection is, is what's actually discriminatory. So I presented them with a proposal. And this was, you know, the, the liberals on one side, and then you had the conservatives and the, and the, and the NDP on the other. And uh, regarding M103, and uh, un unfortunately, I, I was uh, I came out of there a little disappointed because the politics is so stark that even though I knew that there were people on the liberal side who were nodding along who agreed with what I was saying, they just didn't want to give an inch to the opposition because that's just the nature of it. You know, they uh, they're more concerned about their constituents and how it would play. Uh, but what I proposed was that use the term anti-Muslim bigotry. Anti-Muslim bigotry is real, and it doesn't impinge on the free speech issues that people have concerns with when it comes to Islamophobia. Islamophobia, I think, is a is a pernicious word. It's there's a reason the Muslim Brotherhood loves it so much because there are genuine victims of anti-Muslim hate, and what it does is it exploits what they go through. It, it exploits their pain and their experience, and uses that for the political purpose of stopping criticism of Islam, right? So I, I think it's a particularly evil and, and sinister term for that reason. So I, I told them, I'm, just use the word anti-Muslim bigotry. First of all, that's what you mean by Islamophobia. It means the exact same thing. You're not giving an inch. But if you use that term, you would get support from conservatives. You get support from everybody else because 
nobody wants to oppose a motion that says, you know, don't be bigoted against Muslims or against any other group. Um, and I, I think that that really is the way we should go about it. If they truly cared about the issue, they would want as much universal support they want universal support for it, as much support as they could possibly get. Uh, but uh, the fact that they're just sticking to semantics, right, and just keeping this, making this a partisan issue, I think is, is damaging to the discourse throughout, everywhere. So I'm going to leave you with this, uh, just a general thing. When we talk about Islamic terrorism, in my opinion, the worst thing about Islam and the worst thing about any religion uh, at any time in history isn't the violence. I think the violence is just a symptom. You know, it's like if you have cancer and you have a fever and you try to treat the fever, it's not going to do anything about the cancer. Tylenol is not going to cure it. Um, so Islamic terror, the terrorism itself is, isn't just about bombs and bodies. Um, it's about fear. So, in if you look at Charlie Hebdo and the cartoons, there were many people who reported on it who wouldn't print the cartoons because they thought it would offend a lot of Muslims if they printed the cartoons. And the cartoons were the reason that you know that over a dozen people died. You know, were shot in cold blood in Paris at the Charlie Hebdo offices. And you know, again, this whole idea of treating you know Muslims different from Christianity, and and people are afraid to talk about it. When you, when you're afraid to talk about it, because you know you think if I print the cartoons, if I criticize Islam, if I say something, that's going to uh, that's, that's going to curb terrorism, right? If I if I hold back, if I don't do that stuff, then maybe we can curb terrorism in a way. But if you hold yourself back, if you hold back from speaking up then you're already a victim of terrorism. That's how terrorism works. That's, that's how fear works. You know, you've, you've already been cowed into silence. And th that's the most important thing to remember. And, and I have, there, you know, we were talking about this last night, that you know, an event like this, you know, when you have something called the Atheist Muslim, a lot of people won't, they wouldn't share it because you know, like, I don't want to get called a bigot by my colleagues. Or you know, I, had, I, I actually had a guy come up to me after talk at the University of Toronto, who said that you know I really like Sam Harris, but I don't share his stuff. I read everything he does, and I think it's really interesting. But if I share it, then everyone's going to call me a racist and a bigot, and I don't want to do that. So, you know, and I, uh, my position on that has always been that if you don't speak up, then you're already giving in to um, what the broader connotation of terrorism is, what terrorism, how the way it actually works. So. You know, we're very blessed here to have uh, free speech and to have our, our freedom to express ourselves as you want. So they win if you don't speak up. So please speak up. And thank you very much. Appreciate it.